Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson one of the Hello World series of my 6809 assembly tutorials. What's the Hello World series? Well, each time we do this, we're going to look at a different system. We're going to get a simple Hello World message onto the screen in roughly the easiest way possible with some limitations. And also we're then going to extend that and we're going to show a monitor that shows the contents of the 6809 registers and also a dump of some other memory. Now, this is basically the first thing I do when I come to a new system because once I can get some text on the screen, I I can get some output from the system onto the screen and once I can see the registers and the memory then I can start to play with bits of hardware like the sound and the joystick and see what's really going on under the hood so to speak. So what we do in these series is we write our hello world. We do this based on a print character routine. We write our own print character routine and that print character routine where possible doesn't use the firmware in any way. That's why I say it's not necessarily the simplest way possible because there's maybe cases where we could use the firmware in some way, but we try and avoid that. Now, today's example was written on the Dragon, but to my knowledge, it will work on the Coco as well, the Tandy Coco, because they're basically the same machine. As I say, I don't use the firmware at all in my tutorials. I just use the hardware where I can. So I don't think it's going to make any difference in this case, or at least any significant difference. So it should work on both systems. Anyway, let's go over to today's source code and let's see it in action. So here it is. This is the first one. This is the Hello World example, the basic Hello World. So it's firing up here. And there we go. Hello World. There's our Hello World message. And if I go here, this was running on the Dragon 64. But if I change this to the Tandy Coco, and if I just reattach my cartridge here, there you go, you can see Hello World now. It looks like the um, the memory initializes in a different way because it looks like we've got some corruption here, but you can see basically we've got the Hello World message. So as I say, I believe it will work fine on both the Dragon and the Tandy Coco, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, so we're going to go over this example. We're going to discuss how each part of the code works. We're also going to look at the build script, how I'm getting the assembler to assemble this file. The idea being that however you're looking to do things, whether you're looking to use the same tools as me, because you can download all the scripts I use from my website, or if you're looking to really you know, tear this apart and go from scratch with a different assembler, different syntax maybe, and write your own example, hopefully you can just pick the bits that you're interested in from my example and make something of your own. Whatever you want to do, whatever, hopefully this will help you out. Okay, so we're going to go over each section of this and discuss what's going on. Now, first we're defining two bytes of memory. This area is memory, 7,000 onwards. And we're defining an X and a Y position for the current cursor. This is the next location of the next character. Our print character routine is going to draw a single character. And then we're extending that into a print string routine, which will do the work of printing our entire Hello World message to the screen. The reason we're doing it that way is that's what my monitor wants later on. So this is going to be extended later in that way. So that's what those are. Our cartridge, we're building a cartridge here, not a tape, because tapes are a pain. Cartridges are nice and easy, and um, I cover a lot of tutorials, so I always go for the easiest way of getting some code running. So cartridges are what we're doing here. And the cartridge starts at C000, there's no header as such. And then we just start off by defining a valid stack pointer for the S stack, the main one. We're loading that at hexadecimal 8000, which is also RAM. We then zero the X and Y position of the cursor just to make sure everything's a good starting point. Might be a mess on that Tandy Coco because it looks like its memory doesn't initialize to zero. Okay, and then we are going to here, we're just going to start by loading the hello message into Y and running print string. Print string is just using our print character routine and I use 255 terminated strings in all of my tutorials. I know people might prefer zero termination, but I started using 255 and once I've started, I am going to finish, so to speak. So all of my tutorials use 255 termination. Now, the bulk of the work that's going on in this, of course, is this print char routine. This is doing all of the dirty work for us. Now, the good thing about the Dragon is we know what state it's going to start up in. I, I, my understanding is the cartridge doesn't really run first. There's like an initialization routine. So I, I believe we can know that the um, text mode is going to start up. We're going to look at switching to different graphics modes in a later tutorial anyway. But at the moment, we can assume that the text mode is going to start up. And it's going to start up, and the text mode base is at memory address hexadecimal 400. Now, the text mode is 32 characters wide, and each byte of the screen memory is one character. So we can calculate the position of any arbitrary character just by uh, taking the base, the Y position we want, multiplying the Y position by 32, and then adding the X position, and that will calculate the memory address of any character we want to draw to. And we're using that X and Y position to calculate consecutive characters. Now, let's just briefly go over to my notes over here because there's something we do need to discuss. 
Okay, so we're using ASCII for our text within the, our source code, but the um, the dragon doesn't quite use ASCII. Um, it's a bit of an odd character set. This is the character set. This is character zero here. Um, and this is the last character 255 here. So you can see the first half of the character set is a capital, uppercase font twice, and then some uh, crude graphics characters in lots of colors, lots of nice colors, but not many, um, not much resolution there. Anyway, um, this is our sort of first line of our font here, but these symbols should actually be the line above. Um, so if we just showed ASCII, firstly, our lowercase characters would be messed up, and secondly, our symbols would be inverted. So we're going to have to do some conversion for that. Okay, we'll see that in a moment. So what we're doing here first is we're calculating the memory address of the byte that we need to change to show a character to the screen. We're taking the Y position, and we're doing some bit shifts to multiply that effectively by 32 here. We're then adding the screen base at hexadecimal 400 here and the X position. So AB now contains the 16-bit address of the memory that we want to change according to cursor X, cursor Y. We're then moving that into X here. So X contains now the memory address we need to change. So now we know where we want to write. We just need to work out what we want to write. We've got an ASCII string here. Um, and you'll notice there's a lowercase character in it. And that's intentional because it's got to be removed. So what we're doing now is we're checking to see if we've got a symbol, because remember those symbols are effectively aligned too high and they would end up inverted. So first of all, we're comparing to this character here. Now this is effectively the top of the capital range. If we are lower than that, then our character is going to be okay. But if we're above that, we need to subtract 32. And this has the effect of converting uppercase to lowercase. So we've converted our character to uppercase here. And so here we're subtracting 32, and this has the effect of converting lowercase to uppercase. So now all of our characters are going to be capitals. Um, what we're doing next is we're checking to see if we've got a symbol. If we have got a symbol, i.e. the exclamation mark to question mark, something like that, we need to move them up two lines to move them past, because otherwise they would show as inverted here. We need to move them down to this line here. So that's what we're doing in this next part here. Once we've done that, we can then store the resulting calculated character to the screen. We then move the X position along one, and we see if we're at the end of the line. And if we are, then we do a new line. Our new line is simply clearing the X position to zero, and then increasing the Y position by one. And that will move us down the line. OK, let's just run that again, and let's just see what happens if we turn off some of the code here. So you can see our hello world here. And as I say, um, you can see this is a lowercase e, but that's been removed and converted to uppercase here. And that's being done by this line here. Well, effectively, these lines are doing the comparison as well. So if I run this now, well, that conversion is missing. So the e double l, which are all lowercase here, have been changed accidentally to a percentage and some garbage here. Now, removing that code has also effectively broken our symbol conversion code because we're now skipping over this module as well and that means that our space and our exclamation mark question mark have been inverted now if I just take this out they would start to work again because now this code is now operating again this is converting the space and the question mark exclamation mark and fixing those up but you can see there that we we do need those conversions to allow uh, the ASCII that our to allow the ASCII that our assembler is outputting to be visible on the screen. Now, the last thing in our ROM is we have to pad it out to be a full 16 kilobytes. Now, I've done that by writing a reset vector here, but it doesn't actually appear to um, function. The vectors seem to be being mapped by ROM or something because uh, they don't seem to apply to the cartridge. But just for, um, just for consistency, I've put it in there, and that will complete the valid ROM file. Now, we'll look how to assemble that in a moment, but first I'm just going to discuss the more advanced version. Now, the advanced version includes this monitor assembly file here. We're not going to discuss how that works because it's a little bit tricky and it's not the point I'm wanting to make. Now, all of this monitor relies on is the new line and the print child routine working the same. And once you've got those, you can then use this monitor command to see the contents of all the registers or the memdump command to see an area of memory dumped to the screen. And I'll just show you that working here. 
So here we've dumped the registers and we've loaded D with one, two, three, four, and you can see that represented here and you can see the other registers all here. So this is great for um, testing out the, if we're reading in from hardware and you want to see it quickly to the screen or if things are going weird and you need to double check that your loop counters are working as they should be. And then we've got this memory dump here of this memory range here. And uh, I can use this just for a valid purpose today. So if I just do F, F, F zero here and I compile again, well, let's see what our values are here. Well, this is the vectors here and B3, B4 is the last one here. So this is what should be this here. So, the, the, so what I'm saying is um, it looks like the ROM footer is not actually being applied to the memory range that's being operated by the processor. But as I say, for consistency, it felt good to put a nice proper reset vector for the start of our cartridge. But it, it seems like, um, I guess the ROM is doing some stuff first, which is probably why I've got that nice screen mode set up. But anyway, as I say, just to, the point I was making there is that these tools are very handy when you're trying to work out what's going on in a system. And as I say, all you need is a, um, a print character routine that's going to leave all of the registers unchanged and a new line. And you can use these on any 6809 processor, hopefully. So I find them very, very helpful. I use them on all of my examples and we'll see them on the FM7 and the Vectrex later on. Okay. So that's the code. How do we actually build it? Well, I'm using Mac OS, which is called ASW.exe. And this is a multi-platform assembler. It can assemble to multiple um, destinations. And it also runs on multiple platforms as a Linux version, a Windows version, things like that. So that's what I use. Now, here's the comp compilation script. This is running in a batch file. And the source ASM file will be called build file when this command runs. So that's the source ASM. We're then specifying the CPU type, 6809. That's the processor of the Dragon. We're outputting a listing file. Now, this is a debugging function. A listing file contains each of the source lines and the output bytes, and it's very handy for when things don't work the way you thought they would. I was having some trouble um, yesterday with the Vectrex, which uses a weird direct page, and I didn't realize, I guess, how AS W was going to assemble the um, command because I was putting um, I was putting like STA dollar sixty nine and I thought that would store into the direct page sixty nine but it was actually converting it to zero zero sixty nine. Uh, so it wasn't storing to the, the diet page, which was not at zero anymore. I didn't think that was the way it would work, but it was. And that kind of thing, the listing files were invaluable. If you're just getting started, um, you possibly won't understand what you're seeing in them. So um, if you can get them enabled, please, I'd recommend it. But if you can't, if your assembler doesn't support them or you can't figure it out, yeah, don't worry about it in the early days. But as I say, they are a real help when you're trying to figure out what's going on under the hood, so to speak. Here I'm defining a symbol, build DGN. This is because um, my multi-platform code switches modules on and off depending on the system we're building for. So that's used by that. And then we're outputting something called prog.build. Now this isn't the ROM cartridge yet. This is an intermediary file format that we need to convert. So assuming that works okay, we then can convert that into a binary with p2bin. And this converts the build file into a bin file, which is effectively the finished ROM file for this system, very simple. So that's converted now into a file format we can use. I'm using the assembler xraw, and we can specify to run a cartridge on the command line with minus run, and then the name of the cartridge here. So this is starting up our emulator, and this is something I'd really recommend you try and do. Um, when you start writing a, a new system, you want to try and make a build file that starts that cartridge up as fast as possible, whatever way that is. And as I say, in this case, it's a ROM cartridge and it was specified on the command line. Now, in the Vectrex's case, I had to get a bit extreme. I actually modified the um, firmware ROM of the emulator because the Vectrex by default shows a splash screen for about 10 seconds. And if I lose 10 seconds every time I build a file, I'm going to be wasting hours and hours by the time I get anything working. So I modified the ROM so it's get the splash screen and as I say I'd strongly recommend you spend uh, if you've got a new system or you're not using my scripts spend a couple of hours or a day or two if you need to trying to get your emulator running as fast as possible loading up all automatically because if you're having to do lots of intermediary stages it's going to add lots of time to your programming and especially when you're struggling and you're not sure what you're doing because you could have to compile your code 50 or 100 times to try and get the result if you don't understand what's happening so you know it, it all adds up and so you know saving you know, 10 seconds each time it, it really becomes important especially if you're getting frustrated so i do recommend you think about that okay anyway that's um the end of today's example now um, of course you can go to my website you can download the build scripts you can't download the rom cartridges for the dragon i'm afraid you'll have to find your own the um 
the, the ROMs for the system, sorry, yeah, they, they're, you can't really distribute them, so you're going to have to find your own, but I'm sure you can. Um, if, you, if that's a problem, then you can always program one of the other 6809 systems, which that's not an issue for anymore. But um, as I say, you can buy, download the build scripts and you can download the source code that you saw today. So if you're interested, please go ahead and do that. I hope you're going to stick around. Um, I hope you find this interesting. Um, if you have, please like and subscribe. Liking the videos makes YouTube recommend them more and subscribing encourages me to keep making them because I'm um, covering a lot of systems and I'm having to sort of juggle things a bit and it takes up a lot of my free time, of course, as you can guess. Um, we're going to come back to the Dragon. I've got a few more tutorials planned. I'm going to be doing some graphics work. I'm going to be doing some sound work and we're going to be reading in from the keys and the joystick. I've been really working hard on the old Dragon. So um, hopefully, um, if you're interested in this, system you'll follow around but whatever you decide to do i hope you enjoy your programming and the dragon thanks for watching today and goodbye